Welcome to Talking with Tatchell. The government has announced proposals to reform the House of Lords and in the small print, buried away, are proposals to entrench the privileged status of the Church of England, the right of Church of England bishops to sit in the House of Lords without any public election or accountability. This is, of course, just symptomatic of the government's uh, appeasement of faith groups. It's a uh, giving of faith groups privileged protection and status. Um, House of Lords is just one of many issues where the government is seeking to give these faith organizations special legal protection and rights over and above everyone else. We've seen the big debate about the sexual orientation regulations and the wish of religious organizations to be exempt from the laws protecting lesbians and gays against discrimination. We have seen the government's push for more faith schools. We have seen the controversies over Jerry Springer, the opera, and the Danish cartoons. It seems to me that we are witnessing a rise of religious fundamentalism and that this rise is increasingly being accommodated by the government. With me today to discuss the emergence of, or the re-emergence of religious fundamentalism and its threat to democracy and human rights is Keith Wood, Director of the National Secular Society. Welcome, Keith. Hello, Peter. I I'm, I'm, want to start by just looking at the whole issue of your assessment of, of, of where we're going with this uh, rise of religious influence, in particular, not a progressive religious influence. We aren't seeing the emergence of any Archbishop Desmond Tutus. We're seeing the emergence of very right-wing religious fundamentalists from the Christian, Judaist, and, and, and Muslim faith. And I just want to get your take on how much of a threat do you really think it is? Well, I've been doing this job for 10 years, um, and I think when I started, the National Secular Society was regarded as being a little bit quaint in that uh, religion was going down the pan uh, because church attendance was declining at a, at a substantial rate, um, and that uh, really we, we, it was a non-cause because it was just about to die. But in that 10 years, progressively, as religion, religious observance has continued to decline to the point now that there are only 7% of people in church on an average Sunday, almost in, in uh, inverse ratio to that, religious influence has increased and increased and increased. And, and during that time, I think minority faiths have become more and more insistent um, that the whole minority uh, ethnic side has been uh, added to the, to the mix and religions come in that way and, and so the government has been reacting to that by giving minority religious leaders more and more recognition and power. Um, and the out, outshot of it now is that we're fighting on all fronts an absolutely unprecedented rate of uh, religious influence, both Christian and minority faiths over all, all areas, well, whether well, it's education. Well, uh, why is that wrong? Well, I'm playing I, devil's no, advocate. The, of but course, yes. but uh, education, freedom of speech, even medical issues, all the whole gamut is absolutely astounding. Um, and I think, and minority rights. Do, and do why, it's wrong, why it's wrong, I think, is that this country has been moving since the 1960s further and further, and rightly in my opinion, into human rights for the individual. And that's now in, in reverse. I actually think, for example, gay rights, which is quite a litmus test of all of this, is at its high watermark. We see in the States how the gay marriage uh, uh, campaign has completely and utterly failed. And I think that's actually quite a, a worrying warning note. And it's all to do with religious influence. Staying with the states just briefly, uh, I think the last presidential election was lost, um, was, it was totally influenced, and that uh, uh, the president remained there because of uh, religious influence by the televangelists uh, and by the Catholic Church. And yeah, I but, think but, they but swung in, it. in this country, we don't have that. 
So isn't, isn't, it, isn't it possibly true that this is just the last gasp of those who are you know, seeing their power as religious leaders slipping away? If only that were the case, I should be delighted, but it isn't. Let's not forget that, uh, that Mr. Blair is unquestionably the most religious prime minister since Gladstone. Mm -hmm. um, and what religion wanted, it got. Um, you mentioned the House of Lords just now. When they had their last major review about it, uh, round about 2000 with the Wakeham Commission, uh, the Prime Minister said, in the terms of reference, he signed them himself, that he wasn't proposing uh, that, that, that there should be any change to the bishop's representation, not even any reduction. It was that was part of the terms of reference. So that was, they valued their contribution. No mention of the fact that Britain is the only Western democracy to give clerics ex officio seats in their legislature, the only one. And what does Mr. Blair want to do to modernize it, to actually extend it? They might as well cross, it, cross out the word House of Lords and put Senate. That's clearly where they're heading. And that's grossly undemocratic because the, these clerics are not even representative of, of many of their own followers. There aren't many of the followers anyway, and the totality of them are the minority faiths, uh, a minority ethnic people in the country is less than 5%. Mm. So it's going to be grossly disproportionate. And these well, people are, are, are very mm. fundamentalist within, and, and very, I think, anti-human rights. Well, you know, I take all those points, but, um, and I share your concern about the rise of religious fundamentalism. But even so, don't we have the reassurance that the vast majority of the people in this country who will have ultimate say, um, that they do not share these fundamentalist views? You're right in terms of what the ordinary people think. Uh, I think most ordinary people were appalled to see the narrow-minded, anti-gay uh, antics of, of the religious people over the sexual orientation regulations and I think that's why church attendances for Catholics for example is a half roughly of what it was in 1980. People are disappearing but what are they leaving behind from these churches? They're leaving the more fundamentalist, the more evangelical people in the churches so they're much more hardline. The Church of England ain't what the Church of England was. I've even had deans and bishops almost crying on my shoulders at a cocktail party saying this isn't the organization I joined and the sooner I retire the better and I have to say I have some sympathy with them. It's actually very, very hard line. And don't be put off by, uh, by William's uh, cuddly beard. He's actually very hard uh, underneath. He wants church schools to be small churches, to have Eucharist and that kind of thing that you don't hear any longer the, the joke as you would in the 1960s, oh, well, you don't need to believe anything to be a Church of England priest. They get booted out. And if they're gay, goodness help them. So uh, I actually think that despite the, the fact that the ordinary people in the street are, as you say, have moved on and think the churches are antediluvian, the power still resides with the, with the churches in many ways uh, directly through the House of Lords, um, and I mean, I, I, there's the, the Bishop of Chelmsford, um, who was on the House of Lords Reform Committee, was bragging, and I've, I've got the quote, I've, I've, I've seen the, the, the article of which it's part, of, of, of the immense privilege of being um, uh, in the House of Lords, uh, that it gives you, immense privileges it gives you, and that if you write on House of Lords note paper to a minister, you get an answer virtually by return that even ordinary peers don't get. Mm. So that, it, it's not just um, a, a symbolic power, it's actually very, very real, mm. and, they, and they operate it very much for their own interests. I had the most classic case um, just before Christmas where I found a, 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 a a clandestine uh, amendment going through Parliament, through the House of Lords, put in on the very last possible day of the very last stage, um, adopted by the government, and it just had the words in Wales, and to some very strange act, altering, altering that. And nobody noticed it, but I happened to recognize those sections, and I looked at it much more carefully, and the effect of that was to dismantle 
the 10-year lasting uh, protection uh, against discrimination against non-religious mm -hmm. teachers uh, in publicly funded schools affected tens of thousands of people, of teachers mm -hmm. or non-teaching staff in, in publicly funded phase schools. And I couldn't overturn it. I managed to have an hour's debate in both the Lords, provoked in the House of Lords and in the House of Commons, but we didn't manage to uh, uh, overturn it. And okay, the unions... can, I, can I stop you there? I mean, yeah. Do you actually think the government is doing this out of a genuine conviction, or is this just electoral opportunism? Are they just doing this to sort of win the votes of these religious minorities, or is it actually a government conviction? I think the government conviction is that anything the church wants, it gets. I don't actually think that's an but electoral why? thing. But why? Because of Mr. Blair. The number of times mm. I've been to members of the House of Lords and the House of Commons, when very strange things have happened very, very quickly and, 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 and without apparent, uh, in the same way that they would happen for anything else, and you ask the same question, how on earth did that happen? And the answer's always the same it could only have happened with the implicit and, in fact, explicit assistance of number 10. The last lot of, uh, of um, uh, anti-discrimination legislation that went through Parliament um, on employment, on sexual orientation regulations, what not many people know is that the very last moment there was the most massive exemption given for, on sexual orientation to organised religion. And that, I proved that that change was made after the public consultation had shut and that it was done without Stonewall or any other gay rights organization being consulted about the effects of it. And I've been at a public committee that was, that was convened very unusually to actually discuss that and bring the, the relevant department to account. And they said breathtakingly to the question, why was uh, Stonewall or other relevant organizations not consulted? And the hapless civil servant said before he was corrected, because the church thought the exemptions didn't go far enough. Mm. And that, seemed, that was the, the answer to everything. Mm. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what human rights are. It's what the church wants. And the exact mm. wording of this exemption was demanded by the Church of England and appeared almost exactly verbatim in the regulations. Would, would you agree with me that, in fact, the real enemy, if we want to use that term, in this situation is not religion per se, but religious fundamentalism? After all, there are very many allies for democracy and human rights within all the faiths, and they have often spoken out in defense of universal human rights. It just strikes me that it is a particular section of churches, mosques, and synagogues who seem to be pushing this hardline agenda. Um, is that your view? No. Um, uh, I, you're right to a degree, but it's a question of how, for, how right. And in, in my opinion, there are some outstanding examples in each faith um, of people who uh, have stood out against injustice and, and, and for human rights. Uh, but it's, the key issue is about the people who are really in power. It's not about the people in the pews. It's about those who are in, in the positions of power that matter for the purposes of this, of this discussion, in my opinion. Well, well, would one way of dealing with it be to link up with those liberal and progressives within the different religious strands to help support and bolster them so their voices are heard as a counterweight to the hardline reactionaries. But I'm afraid those are the ones who are losing out. An absolute uh, wonderful case study of what you're suggesting is the Church of England itself. And if you like, on the one hand, the liberal wing, and on the other, the evangelical wing. And it's being played out, and I think it will end up in the schism of the Church of England uh, with, on the one side, the, the, the Africans and the Southern Cone, as they like to call it, but basically uh, the uh, uh, South America and... and, and uh, Do you think that schism would be a good thing? Well, yes, in a way, I do. But I think that, but what I worry about is how big the bit that's left will be of the liberals. Because the, the, the evangelicals are the ones that are putting in all the money. 
Mm. Uh, they're the ones who seem to have the strongest voice. Mm. Uh, and you see it over the issue of homosexuality and women priests in, in the church. And th the liberals are losing. And what's actually happening in this massive decline in church attendance is that the moderates are actually just walking away from it and saying, I don't want to work with these people. And it's the fundamentalists who are left putting in the money and actually taking control. So I, I, the prognosis is terribly poor, but it's the people who are in the evangelical position who are getting all the positions of power. There's no question mm. about it. Mm. And they're the ones who are, who are, who are demanding with, with uh, the, the, uh, the concessions from the government. And the, another example of that, let's not just stick with the Anglicans, the Catholic Church. I mean, over, over quotas for, uh, for schools uh, so that people who weren't of the faith uh, had some bite of the cherry, given these are 100% publicly funded schools and there are huge issues about societal integration involved with all of that. Uh, Cardinal Murphy O'Connor quite clearly went to the Prime Minister and bashed his fist on the table and said, we ain't having this, even though it theoretically only applies to new schools, of which we won't have very many because the school population is going down. We think your ultimate aim is to do this for all schools, and we ain't having it. And, and the poor, hapless education secretary, Alan Johnson, had to, clearly on Downing Street's instructions, uh, have the, 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 what was described as the most um, the quickest U-turn in political history, and I feel mm. sorry for him because I'm mm. sure it wasn't his decision. Mm. Well, look, look, like you, I'm an atheist and a secularist. You know, I believe in humanism. And, you know, I think religion is superstition, uh, but also I will defend religious people against discrimination. You know, if they are the subject of discrimination and prejudice, that has to be resisted. Uh, I'll be first in line Me too. To, to, to defend Me too. them. Yeah. But the question is isolating, to me, it's about isolating those who are seeking to use religion for their own, what is basically a right-wing political agenda. And, you know, I know the left-right analogy is not strictly, you know, no, no. accurate in terms of religion, but, but broadly speaking, those in the fundamentalist strands of all religions are politically analogous to much of the right, and their views on women or gay people or people of other faith is often analogous to you know, far-right extreme groups. Um, now, my view is, or, or my concern, or my objective, uh, is about how can we isolate the, the fundamentalist wing um, because they are the real threat. The, the, the liberal progressive wing, which, as you say, is in decline and being marginalized, they are not a threat. I would like to see them strengthened and empowered, but they are not a threat. The real threat are the hardliners. How do we deal with them? How do we counteract them? How do we prize them away from the government's embrace and the government's granting to them of privileged status? Well, we had uh, that whole situation being played out in the House of Lords uh, on the 9th of January as part of the debate on the sexual orientation regulations. And although it was being suggested that it was just actually the lunatic fringe that was uh, uh, opposing these regulations, um, sadly, that wasn't true. And all, I, I was at the debate, uh, watched it very carefully, and with the exception of Norman Tebbit, who's kind of the Lord's own Victor Meldrew, uh, the, practically all of the speakers um, opposing the regulations were religious, and they were representing the totality of the large established at the large uh, organizational churches uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, and of the bench of bishops, there were, I think, five bishops there, four or five, and only one voted um, uh, on the liberal side, and notably, he didn't speak. And there was only one person who spoke from a religious perspective in a two- or three-hour debate um, on the liberal side of the argument uh, and that was an openly gay man, Chris Smith, Lord mm. Smith of, t of uh, uh, Finsbury. Um, so I think that your word, isolate, implies that it's a small portion that just needs to be kind of excised. Sadly, it's the whole body politic, minus 5%, that's mm. the problem. And mm. so the word, the verb isolate, sadly, is not appropriate. Mm.
I mean, well, going back to this point, I mean, how do you feel that we can counter the way in which the government is giving this privileged access and power to religious groups? As you say quite rightly, it's very interesting that on all major social policies, religious leaders are consulted, they're brought into Downing Street. Whereas human rights organizations, civil liberties groups, uh, are never consulted, never given such privileged status. That strikes me as very worrying. Of course, also, what's doubly worrying is the fact that the people they're consulting with are not the liberal and progressives, not the people who share New Labour's ostensible commitment to you know, social values and, and, and democracy and human rights, but people who actually, in many cases, um, play fast and loose with, with, with those concepts and, uh, and tend towards quite an authoritarian stance. Mm, now, now how, how do we... What can we do to challenge the government over this and, and, and reverse this privileged access and status that religious groups are being given? Well, I think part of it will solve itself uh, when, we, uh, when Mr Blair eventually finds his way out of Downing Street, because there's no question that he's been... Uh, the guiding light on most of this. I'm absolutely convinced of that. The only problem is it does rather depend who follows him. Um, and one of the stories that I've heard from more than one source and wonder whether it really is apocryphal about uh, Mr. Brown uh, is that he was asked what he would like to do as a young boy uh, when, when he grew up. Um, and, uh, and it wasn't being a train driver, but it was the most precocious answer or chilling answer I've ever heard. He said, my second objective would be to be Prime Minister, and my first objective would be to be moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. And I have had um, tussles with, uh, with Mr. Brown over giving privilege VAT exemption to places of worship, but not to other listed places of uh, buildings. Uh, and I worry whether we'll have some of the same uh, with him, but whether it will be quite, if he's the, the, the successor, um, but whether it's quite as, uh, as difficult it as has been for, um, uh, for, Mr. Brown, I do, uh, for Mr. Blair, I don't know. But he has gone to extreme uh, lengths on this particular issue of VAT to even uh, go against a European directive quite deliberately um, to give churches the benefit that he wanted to give them. I mean, I, I take your point that a lot of this seems to be emanating from Tony Blair, but I, I, I would also get the sense that the alliance with faith groups does seem to be very much part of the New Labour project. And a lot of it does, frankly, strike me as electoral opportunism. This is a way to harvest votes, you know, an appeal to, if necessary, prejudiced sectors of the electorship. Yeah. Um, in a, in a bid to get votes. It's, um, a, it's a very perceptive point, that. But, but I'm not, I'm the, there's another element to it, which I don't think many people have, uh, have uh, worked out, which is that, I mean, I, I've asked a number of senior government people um, and put them under considerable pressure to ask them to, to justify logically why they do that. Uh, because the, 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 it's, it's mainly minority ethnic people that they're seeking to... Uh, or, or minority faith equals also minority ethnic groups uh, by and large um, that they're targeting, apart from the, obviously the, ch the, the Church of England and, and the Catholics. Um, and and, and some, of the, some of the leaders that, that, that they uh, invite to number 10, if you said, you know, are, are from extraordinarily small groups like the Baha'is, you know, and you just really wonder. But the uh, conclusion that I've come to is that they, or they appear to claim that it's actually a way of getting to disadvantaged minorities uh, because the, uh, the churches have facilities and, and, and have members who are disadvantaged and it's a way of, of getting to them. Well, to a degree, that's reasonable uh, if it were so, but why do they have to make so much fuss about actually wanting to know what the religious leaders think. And it's got to very formal stages, this. I mean, there was a, a report called Working Together, drawn up by the Home Office, which is effectively an instruction to all arms of government to seek the opinions of, minor of faith leaders, including minor minority faith leaders, on every policy issue. Mm. I mean, to make a cheap point, I really, and this, this did slightly come up, 
uh, even on sentencing policy, uh, and you start to wonder about teeth, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and how many hands are going to be left out of all of that. I mean, I don't think that's an appropriate place to find to be asking questions about sentencing policy. But that gives you an idea of how far that they're going. But there's another worry about this too, which is it, it feeds directly into, uh, into faith-based welfare. And that's the next big project. Partly this, this, the, the, uh, the government's obsession with kind of outsourcing everything so they don't have to take responsibility for it. But clearly uh, jobs in the future that are in welfare that are being publicly funded and where people's religion or, or lack of it have never been a concern might well soon be coming in the future uh, into the faith-based area where it is of, ma of huge concern and they'll probably lose their jobs. Mm. And I worry about uh, the people in these minority faiths uh, and the minority ethnic groups, if they aren't of the faith, um, whether they're going to be appropriately dealt with and whether they're going to want to get any welfare from having to go mm. to the, 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 their temple or mosque with their hand mm. out. Yeah, I find that very disturbing in the way in which the government is colluding with the redefinition of ethnic minority people not on the basis of their ethnicity but on the basis of their gen in general their faith. Um, I look back to a period for example when uh, the Asian communities organized through the Indian Workers Association or the Asian youth movements where Asian people of all ethnic and religious backgrounds work together, united, uh, around a common agenda to fight discrimination, tackle bad housing, poor job opportunities and so on. And what we're seeing now increasingly is the government not addressing any of these fundamental socio-economic issues, but just pandering to bigotry and prejudice within certain sectors. Now, to me, it's a very, very divisive strategy, it seems to be. We divide the Asian community, for example, up into you know, Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, Buddhists, and so on. Um, that's a recipe for, for, for fragmenting that community and setting those communities against each other. And if I was a conspiracy theorist, which I'm not, I would think that perhaps this is part of a government strategy to try and weaken those, those communities and those movements by dividing them on religious grounds um, and that's exactly the kind of, that's the dream of the BNP. The British National Party couldn't have done it better. Well, I, I've got a different take on that. I'm always looking up the other end of that. We, we've got a lot in common, but I'm looking up the other end of that, te that telescope. And I think it's that the government's absolute obsession with religion is blinding them to the effects of what they are doing. Religion trumps all and they don't care what damage is done in the process of, of, of pursuing their pro-religious agenda. And there couldn't be a better example than what they're proposing to do on minority faith schools. Now, you know the National Secular Society for 130 years has opposed religious schools, particularly publicly funded ones. They don't want proselytization. And there are all sorts of other reasons why we shouldn't have them. But when you actually extend that over to bringing in minority faith schools, which are also minority ethnic schools, uh, so we're going to have mono-ethnic schools and children busing to, uh, with, uh, largely with brown skins, going to one group of schools, passing another bus with children largely white, right, going to another group of schools, and thinking what that's going to do for the future of race relations in this country in the next generation, it frightens the hell out of me and I just can't think what they're doing. I think it's yeah. madness. I, I agree. I think it's, it's, it's a future for social division, not social cohesion, for disharmonious community relations, for dividing us all in, in, on the basis of faith or non-faith and that is not surely compatible with a democratic society where everybody should be equal where equal rights should apply to everyone and where non-discrimination should be applied to every disadvantaged and marginalised community. So on that note, I think we'll finish this week and thank you very much for watching Talking with Tatchell.